pipe. And then he entered into his gates with singing and to his courtroom with praise. And we're so glad you are here. If you are a first time guest, it is our joy and it is our prayer that you might experience the love of God through the music message and God's people this morning. And so I would love to spend just a second with you at the end of the service just to say hi, get to know you just a little bit better. If you have not taken Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your leader and forgiver, we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, commit your life to him, the greatest life possible. Amen? Amen. In this world and in the world to come, trust me. And if you have not made your commitment to Jesus Christ, we're going to uh, give you an opportunity to do so after the message today. Um, our, okay, we've got a lot of the crowd here this morning. Amen. And we're so blessed by the uh, uh, Boy Scouts, just not because they're here this morning, but also because of the wonderful work that they do. Um, developing young men and uh, blessing the church. Uh, they are always so good. Whenever we ask them to help out with something, they are there. And uh, so we praise uh, God for them and thank them for their acts of service. And uh, we, our hearts are heavy this morning, uh, as you can imagine. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, is, is just terrible. War is terrible. War is hell. I believe it is the mission of the devil to rob, to kill, and to destroy life. But Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. And so my prayers have been dominated this week to pray for um, the situation, that there would be an end of war, that there would be some kind of peaceful negotiation or settlement, that something would happen to stop the violence and to stop the bloodshed. And um, I know you all have been um, making calls and, and prayers too. And um, I, I want to dedicate just our prayer time to that situation that God would move magnificently and marvelously uh, to stop and to prevent any further loss of life. Will you bow your heads and hearts with me? Dear and gracious God, we know we live in a world that is broken, a world that is fallen, a world that is hostile. But Lord God, we know we live in a world where the kingdom of God and all of your righteousness is available to any individual, to any nation that opens its heart up to you. And Lord God, we know that millions and millions of our brothers and sisters in Christ, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, in places we probably wouldn't even expect are offering up unto you this morning the petitions and the intercessions to have your powerful and mighty hand stop, stop hostile forces from taking on any more life. And Lord God, we just know miracles are possible. We believe so much in who you are. And we believe in your sovereignty and we believe, Lord God, of your capabilities and your power. And Lord, we just want you to do something extraordinary, supernatural, amazing in, in this situation. And Lord God, we just, just pray that you would keep your church safe, keep this civilian population safe. And Lord, Please bring this situation to a quick, a quick resolve. And Lord God, we do want to, to lift up our immediate concerns. Um, we're always filled with the spirit of thanksgiving as to who you are, what you're doing, what you will do, the great things you will do for us in the future through Jesus Christ. And so we are living in eager hope of the joys that we will experience in you that are not founded in this world, but are founded in you. And Lord God, whatever our needs are, we know that you are the God who supplies them, each and every one of them according to your riches and glory. 
It doesn't matter if they're relational needs, financial needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, economic needs. It does not matter. You're the Lord of all of it. When we commit our lives to you, you take over all of us, not just little pieces on Sunday morning, but all of us. And God, we just pray that you would move uh, amazingly in the lives of your people today, meeting their needs, allowing us to lay down our pride, lay down our independence, and to just say, Lord God, come, come. You came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down your life a ransom for many. And it is upon your mission, your person that we stand today. In Jesus' name, I pray. And we all said, Amen. 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 I just wanted to let you know that today is our um, fourth of our four classes on Saudi service. So you can come on down. We are uh, creating a society of servanthood. Amen? Amen. People that lay down their lives in order to pick it up again through service. And uh, we want to let you know that is uh, going to continue immediately after the service this morning. As you know, we have been emphasizing the practical application practical Christianity, and we've been in a, a little series with that, and that we've been saying throughout that Christianity alone is both wicked smart and insanely practical, amen? amen. And to that end, we have started a backpack brigade, and we want to encourage you to take some of these backpacks and to um, pass them out to people that you intersect with in the normal routine of your day that might need a, a little bit of a helping hand. We have Bibles in there, scriptures in there. We have personal effects in there uh, and practical things. So, so please grab one. And as Steve said earlier, uh, we got to get the supply chain going uh, a little stronger because of the enormous demand. We also started recently or were organizing a clothing ministry to the uh, underserved in our area. We are going to have an update on that clothing ministry next week, so you don't want to miss that. But we're really, really, really excited about that. Also, in our Practical Christianity series, we talked about that we are to practically take care of our bodies, right? And um, we took on the challenge of our denominational founder, fitness guru, John Wesley. You remember him? He rode over 250,000 miles on horseback, preached over 40,000 sermons uh, in his lifetime. And he had in his den a chamber chair, a horse chair, he called it. And he would bounce up and down on it as often as he could in order to keep his heart rate up and to keep in shape. We took on his challenge. And the note that he wrote to his niece, he said, exercise as often as you can, at minimum, one half hour a day. Now, come on. You're all looking pretty buff to me this morning. Uh, you guys have been exercising a half hour a day. Go ahead and lie to me right now. Go ahead. <laughs> but God is the God of all of it, isn't he? Now, we have many more segments to go in our series. But today I want to take a little mini excursion with you to, to look up at the source of practical Christianity. Who all remembers that guy named Aristotle? Say that with me, Aristotle. The old Greek philosopher, right? He said something that was uh, pretty accurate when he said, we are what we repeatedly do. We are what we repeatedly do. And in some senses, he's very right on with that sentiment. For instance, you remember what Jesus said in John 13, 35? He said, the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, when Jesus said that, he wasn't saying that the world will know we are his disciples if we say loving things to one another. Now, how many of you like loving things being said to you? Put your hand up, right? Loving things are great. They're kind and they're polite. But Jesus was very confident that when we did repeated acts of love for one another, that the world would take notice of that. And they would kind of put two and two together. And they would say, wow, the things that those people are doing for one another, 
uh, kind of are like Jesus-like. And maybe we need to get involved with that. But what we want to say is today is that all doing comes from being. The source of our doing is our being. A few quick examples today are that kind people normally do kind things. Amen? Anybody believe that? Loving people do loving things, right? On the other hand, angry people do angry things, don't they? Right? You're getting my drift here this morning, right? Good people do good things. Bad people do bad things. It's kind of the law of nature. All doing comes from being, which is why our Lord is just as interested in why we do things, even probably more so than what we do, because our why reflects the source of our doing. And that source is our character, our character. Have you ever heard that old expression that the fruit comes from the root? Have you heard of that? So today we're gonna have a very interesting conversation on character. How many of you know that Jesus died to save us, not just from a very hot and miserable eternity? How many of you know that this morning, right? He died to reconcile us to the Father and to reconcile us to himself. And he also died that we might become like him. Or as the famous C.S. Lewis once put it, that we might become little Christ. Little Christ. In order to become little Christ, we need to have the character of Christ formed within us. Amen? And how many know that this is a persistent pursuit? How many know it's not a one and done? Hey, you know what? I got saved at the altar and you know what? That's about as far as I take this thing. The moment we take Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, leader and forgiver, that is the day that God gives us his spirit he gives us his word and he gives us his church so that we might start transforming into little Christ on the planet. Amen. Now we have two texts that are very classic. You know them, you memorized them, you loved them. It's Romans 8, 29 and 1 Corinthians 3, 18. This is the apostle Paul when he says, those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. Morphous is the term there, conform to the likeness of his son. And then in 1 Corinthians 3.18, we who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being what church? Transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Who here drives a Lexus this morning? Put your hand up. Go ahead, don't be afraid. You drive a Lexus, you're, you, you hit the lottery, you're driving a Lexus, right? But do you remember the marketing slogan for Lexus? It's the endless pursuit of perfection, right? Much in the same way, Christians are in the endless pursuit of character perfection found in Christ. Now, our founding forefather, John Wesley, had a lot to say about that, but so did Jesus. In Matthew 5, 48, he said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is what? Perfect. Now, obviously, it has something to do with the deep, the very foundational aspects of our being, namely our character. Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul saw this as a parental love thing that he would see his church keep developing into the character of Christ. In Galatians 4.19, he says this, he says, my dear children for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is fully formed in you. Everybody say fully formed with me. Fully formed. How? He didn't say partially formed, did he? Or somewhat formed. Or kind of formed. No, all the way formed. All the way formed into the image of Jesus Christ, the character of Christ. Now, the more we transform into the character of Christ, the more we reflect the character of our Heavenly Father, 
which is exactly what Jesus did. I want you to listen to Hebrews chapter one, verse three. If you don't know the book of Hebrews, get to know the book of Hebrews. It's one of the most exciting, enthralling, amazing books in the New Testament. But speaking of Jesus, the Hebrew writer, uh, who nobody knows exactly who that was, speaking of Jesus says this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being. Now, the term, the actual Greek term, character, is only found once in the New Testament, and is found right here. When it says the exact representation, it's talking about the character of the Father. In the ancient world, a carasso was an instrument. It was a tool used for carving and engraving. And so when we figuratively apply this text, we, we would say that to have someone's character is to be engraved from the same mold as. So when we think of Jesus being in the character of God, we can say that the fruit doesn't fall very far from the tree, amen? amen. But to, to better reflect this Karasu idea, we would say that he's a chip off the old block. Oh, yeah. No, 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 seriously. Or he's, he's cut from the same mold as the Father. Now, a lot of translators like to use image and representation and exact copy and uh, uh, perfect reproduction of all those things are fine. But listen to what the early uh, Greek fathers, how they interpreted or commentated on Hebrews 1.3. Jesus is the ultimate radiance of the Father, the supreme effulgence, which means light, displaying his glory as the second person of the eternal Godhood. How many know that Jesus truly is all that in a bag of potato chips? How many do you know that, right? It's why we are here right now, uh, loving him, adoring him, worshiping him, and uh, just absolutely joyful in his name. Now, when Philip the Apostle, a disciple before him, when he asked Jesus, show us the Father, Jesus just said, whoa, wait a minute. If you have seen me, you have already seen the Father. Now, Jesus could say that because he and the Father are one. And Jesus could say that because everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus thought, was the perfect, perfect character of the Father. He fully displayed the character of the Father. Now, although they are cut from the same cloth, or he is, and he's a chip off the old block, the, we might ask, what is the character of Christ? And for that, we go to Paul in Galatians chapter five, uh, verses 22 and 23. What is the character of Jesus Christ? Because remember, if we're going to become little Christ, this is the character that we're aiming for. This is called the fruit of the Spirit. I actually call it the fruit of the Trinity because this is what the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this, this is their character, a representative of their character. We all know it, we all love it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You want to know what God is like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You want to know what Jesus is like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You want to know what the Holy Spirit's like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can somebody bring me a drink of water? <laughs> but that's what they're like. And this is the character that the Spirit of God himself is trying to inculcate in us. All of the time, every second we live, every breath that we take, this is the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts and in our lives to give us the character of Christ. Now, I won't ask you to lift up your hand this morning, but is there like a, a little bit of a gap between you and me 
perfectly living in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, talent, uh, gentleness, and self-control. Is there somewhat of a gap? A little gap. Go ahead and look at your spouse sitting right next to you right now and say, that gap is immense. No, it's just kidding. Don't do that because we do, we do do counseling during the week if you need it, okay? Now, images who you are in public. It's really a projection of your essence, a projection of who you want others to think of you or what you want others to think of you. Character is who you are in private, the true you. Character is you all by your lonesome in a room with only you and the internet. Anybody say, oh, me? <laughs> Image is the outside of you. Character is the inside. Jesus Christ is the only person who seamless, who had seamless integration or integrity of his public and his private life. In other words, what you see with Jesus is what you get. Whether he's teaching, preaching, healing, feeding, nurturing, whatever he's doing, and his sidebar conversations with the disciples by himself. Seamless perfection, seamless integration between his public and his private life. Now one of John Wesley's most popular sermons was called The Character of the Methodist, of a Methodist. Now in it, he lists dozens upon dozens of character traits that he wanted all Methodists to cultivate and all Christians in general. Now, things like joy in God, holiness of heart and life, uh, service to others headline this rather lengthy list. I want to encourage you, Methodists this morning, to get online and check it out. It is a really challenging message. And believe me, I have lots to pray about this past week. However, 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 what doesn't get tons of emphases is how much passion John Wesley had for the church of Jesus Christ and how much he wanted all Christians to share in this passion. Listen to what he says here. This is shortly before his death. And he said this, it's quite amazing. He says, I want the whole Christ for my savior. Can anybody say amen? amen. I want the whole Bible. <laughs> Genesis to Revelation. I want the whole Bible for my book. Amen. Anybody say amen? amen? The whole church for my fellowship. Amen. amen. I mean, you know, that means just more than one hour on Sunday. Yeah. Amen? amen? And the whole world for my mission field. I read that. I come to this quote often because I think about how great of a vision our founding father had to see God's glory just roll over this planet and how the church would make that happen. Imagine what our world would be like today if we worked as hard on our character as we do our image, especially our politicians. Amen? Amen especially the Russian president, would not be in Ukraine today if indeed he worked on his character more than his image. So what is the most practical way to develop our character? Remember our series, Practical Christianity. Practice is something we do, amen? Not just something we think, not just something we pray, just not something we hope. It is something that we do. So what is the best 
and most practical way to develop Christ-like character. You might want to hold your ears on this one. Are you ready? That is to become deeply devoted to your local church. Amen. I'll wait for an amen. amen. If I have to fish for it, I will. Okay? The best and most practical way to develop Christ-like character is to become deeply devoted to your local church. What is your local church here this morning, everybody? I think it's called Bay Point, right? Now, I say this for two simple reasons. The first one is that the church, the church's mission is to make disciples. How many do you know that in its nature, disciple making is character formation? It is character development, amen? amen? So when we have our ministries on teaching, on giving, on serving, this is all to develop within you Christ-like character. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that the mission is to go out and make disciples. Not attenders, <laughs> not believers, but disciples. People who are signing up to give their lives to Jesus Christ and saying, look, I will do all that I can, all the time I can, anytime I can, to have my character become like Jesus's, amen? amen. That is the mission, that is always the mission. And the second reason here, is probably maybe we don't expect. The second reason is that we become what we are committed to. And what we are committed to reveals our character. I'll say it again until I get an amen. amen. We become what we are committed to and what we are committed to reveals our character. Amen. Okay, for instance, all right, these young bucks and young ladies and the Boy Scouts are committing themselves to an organization that's not only a service organization, but is character uh, development, amen? amen? For our Boy Scouts, right? On the other hand, a bank robber is committed to doing what? Sorry. Robbing banks. Would you say that person has good character? Okay, how about a liar? A liar that is committed to lying always does what? Does that surprise us? Absolutely not. An alcohol, alcoholic to alcohol. Uh, I think you see the point there. We become what we are committed to. A loving husband and father that is dedicated to his family above his own needs and his own wants we would say has good to great character, wouldn't we? Yes. Amen? Yeah. I think it's, it, it is, it's a natural law that people committed to good things are people of better character. In fact, I'm gonna go so far as to say, and I'm glad we took the hymnals out of the pew a year ago, right? But I will go on to say that, you know what? If you're not committed to good things, you know what? At best, you have character flaws. At worst, you have bad character. Are you following me? Yeah. <laughs> Don't throw anything up here. Simultaneously, the greatest area of improvement and the greatest area of character development is in the local church. Being committed to the local church. Dr. Elton Trueblood lamented 70 years ago. He said the greatest single weakness of the contemporary church 
is that millions of its supposed members are not really involved at all. And what is worse, do not think it strange that they are not. Does anybody think it's strange? Wait a minute, wait a minute. If I am committed to good things and therefore I become better, what is the best thing we can be committed to? The Church of Jesus Christ, amen? Yes. The Church of Jesus Christ is God's redemptive and missional community on the planet. It is the second greatest thing in heaven, Jesus being the first, and it is the greatest thing on the planet. It is what God is doing through the church to spread the kingdom of God, amen? Yes. It is his bride, his temple, it is his body. It is something he, Jesus, of perfect character, loved so much that he gave his life. He died for it. That's how much he loved the church. Now, since we're doing a little meddling here this morning in our practical Christianity series, I can tell you after uh, a long pastorate that I have probably heard every single solitary excuse why people cannot flat out commit to the greatest thing on the planet. I could regale you with a lot of humor and a lot of sadness. I could write a book. But you know what? At this point in my life, I just want people to be honest. <laughs> I just want them to say, look, I'm not going to commit to the mission and to the ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ because I have lousy character. And it makes me value lesser things over the best thing that God has for me, the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, wouldn't that be refreshing? Yeah. To say, I'm not showing up for the Bible study. I'm not showing up for worship, uh, you know, consistently because I got bad character. The other day, um, I'll make a confession. You'll, you'll forgive me, right? This is confidential. Um, you know, I, I, I've been, the uh, last couple of years, I don't know if it's a function of age or anxiety or whatever, um, I, don't, I don't sleep well anymore. And uh, I don't know why I could go to bed late and get up at 3.30. Go to bed early, get up at 3.30. It's all, 3.30, like a, like a clock. So a couple of weeks ago, I got on melatonin. Do I have any melatonin brothers and sisters here this morning? <laughs> and it doesn't matter, I'm up at 3.30. <laughs> so the other day, how many know that your spouse is a gift from God, whether you know it or not? Amen. Right. All right. Lisa, would you like to wave at anybody right now? <laughs> She's sitting in the back there. And so, because it was necessary, because she is my bride of over 37 years now, she said, I want to ask you a question. In her soft and loving way, and boy, I knew it was coming. <laughs> she said, do you think the melatonin's making you more cranky? <laughs> You know, and I wanted to do the opt-out piece like we all do, right? But somebody questions our character. What do we do? We always blame somebody else, right? It's the oldest trick in the book, all the way from Adam, right? And I thought for a moment, because I was developing this message, and I thought for a moment, I said, yeah, I could blame the melatonin. I could blame a lot of things. I could blame whatever, whatever, whatever. But I said, yeah, I'm not going to blame anything or anybody for this. I said to her, it's because right now I have lousy character. And I'm moody because my character is not overcoming my circumstances. Please pray for me. Amen? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That is, well, it took a lot of courage to confess to your spouse that you got character issues, right? But you know what? They know it, they see it, and they still love him. Yeah. 
God knows it, he sees it, and he still loves you, and he wants the best for you. Joel Osteen, a person with whom I have very, very few agreements, and I do mean very few, got it right when he said this. He said, you can be committed to church, but not committed to Christ. But you cannot be committed to Christ and not committed to church. Wow. And you know what? It's absolutely so. You see, the only way that we can pull off all the great things that God has laid in our hearts, and we spent the whole month of January in our vision series, our 3G's vision, reaching thousands of people for Jesus Christ, and planting our preschool this summer, uh, renovating our sanctuary, all these incredible, amazing, fantastic, needle-moving things that God has laid on the leadership of this church is only going to happen if more of us commit more. Amen? Amen. If more of us commit more. Because committing more is a mammoth character move and so what I want to do is to leave you to contemplate your character in terms of your commitment to your local church, Bay Point. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, the glories that you want to reveal in us and through us in your passionate love for your church means that we should be thinking at all times how we can we give more, do more, attend more, commit more. We thank you that we are truly becoming what we're committed to. And if we commit our lives, if we commit our lives to the greatest thing on this planet right now, the Church of Jesus Christ, our character will improve. Lord God, we want to be committed to Jesus Christ with all that we are and, and with all that we have. We want others to experience the same joy. So let me ask the congregation, as your heads are bowed, if you have yet to take Christ as your Savior, I want to give you an invitation to do that now. And if you would like to, go ahead and raise your hand because at the end of the worship, we'll have people pray for you on next steps. And so, if you want to, that's available. And secondly, about, hey, not going willy-nilly with the church, especially in these days that we live, we need to cleave to the body of Christ like we never have before. And if you would like to up your commitment in terms of your time, your talent, your treasure, your heart, please raise your hand right now if you'll do that. Amen. Amen. And I want to go ahead and give you an opportunity at the end of the worship to, to pray with our uh, altar workers. And so, Lord God, we are so blessed, magnificently so, but never let our blessings pull us away from you, but draw us closer to the blesser. In his great and amazing name I pray, and we all said, Amen. Amen.